So we're going to start by talking about the integrative feat, though. This is, um, it's, you know, you can't do this sequentially. You've got to put this together, which is why we have to have these conversations. But when I think of integration, I think of laying out for a Frisbee, as this guy is. And uh, yes, I love baseball. I love watching the outfielders go through the air sideways to intercept the, the ball that they're fielding. It's uh, just, you know, we, we watch highlight reels <laughs> in the US of, of some of these great, these great feats. But uh, integration is this reaching out from, be, from where you are to something beyond. And uh, your flank is utterly exposed. <laughs> and so, um, and it's kind of a leap. It's a leap. And it's going to be the case that this integrative pattern in no way logically reduces to the clues that you're relying on. Okay? So that's why it's integrative and it's a leap. Vectoring, you've got the sense of from here, it's orienting to and beyond. What we're orienting toward, and this is where it just is so interesting, is something that is yet to be known. There's no certainty or insurance policies that an outfielder is going to get that ball, right? So it's a risk, it's a laying out, it's a responsible decision. So responsibility is at the heart of coming to know, right? It's a gesture of hope. You're moving toward what you can't be sure is there yet. So you're, you're moving in hope. It is an imaginative scrabbling toward a half-hidden vision. And we're going to be talking more about this. But I'm hoping that you're trying to track with this with regard to your skill. And in particular, it would be helpful with your skill for you to, to uh, go back to the point A to point B experience. Can you remember when you, somebody taught you to sing or somebody taught you to knit? It's not real fun at the beginning, <laughs> but there comes to be this place when, when you are starting to track with it and you can say, oh, I can uh, ride the bike. Um, and so one thing that's interesting here, I don't know if you have this saying, but we talk a lot about connecting the dots, which means finding the pattern. And that's what we're struggling to do when we uh, make sense of things. So the integrative feat. We're moving via integration to a transformative, irreducible, coherent pattern. It's not linear. It's not additive. Uh, it's kind of backwards. We kind of back ourselves into it. So there's a primacy about the pattern operating even before you've gotten to it. It's calling you. When we get there, integration transforms the clues, as I have said before, and that includes you, it includes the world, it includes meaning. So if you are a driver of a car, you know, I'm, I'm more aware of this, being on the left side of the road here in, in Australia in entirely two tiny uh, lanes with uh, these funny roundabouts and, and signage that uh, look strange, but, but y'all are doing it like this is what you do, right? It's like you're wearing the car and you're dancing through Sydney. <laughs> so that performance is the integrative pattern, okay? In perception, the copperhead is the integrative pattern in a performance. That's the integrative pattern that you're carrying on. And um, hopefully you can see that you're creatively, subsidiarily scrabbling to do that. So we're moving from subsidiary clues toward the integrative pattern. These subsidiary clues we indwell and rely on. I may not have uh, pointed to the word clue yet, but that's a great word because a clue is a half understanding. And you, if you are Hercule Poirot or some famous sleuth, or you're just trying to find your credit card, you have got to look for clues and somehow give yourself to indwell them even if you don't know yet whether they are correct, right? So it's quite risky. <laughs> somehow you've got to climb into the clues. Somehow my body had to figure out what balance means. And I was groping to try to figure that out. I think in a creative performance, this subsidiary area is creative, it's dynamic, 
It's scrabbling attentiveness from. I remember a James Bond movie that started with a race scene. And you know, first he was on a car. Well, the car crashed. Then he picked up something else, and he was on that. Then he was on a motorcycle. Then, and finally, he was running. But he had the same uh, uh, pattern that he was going after the whole time. But he was subsidiarily changing out the means of transportation, you know, as he had his eye on the prize. So that is, I think. An intensely creative area, you put things together synthetically at the subsidiary that gets you to the pattern. Polani loved the idea of um, your two lines of sight are actually contradictory. If you, if you think of them focally, they contradict each other. But if you put them at the subsidiary, we get three dimensional sight. Okay, so things come together creatively continually in the subsidiary. I believe there's three sectors of clues, Glenn Davies. Do you know where this comes from? <laughs> a, a professor that you and I had in seminary. <laughs> yes, this is the Framium, Framium triad. So, uh, you know, John Frame taught me to see things in threes, right? So here we go. So we've got, with the, the instructor, an authoritative guide. And then we've got this this little boy who, for whom the authoritative guide is actually telling him how to use his body, right? And they're looking down at his hands, all right? And then the plan is to put together this tennis game. That's the place of your puzzlement. So the guide's maxims, the authoritative guide, the felt body, and the place of your puzzlement are the three sectors of clues. So my father's words, this crazy hill, dangerous hill, this bike, and my felt body. Actually, I didn't comment on this picture before. Those, those guys are looking at the screen and they're subsidiarily scrabbling with his fing their fingers. Okay, so that's this bodied moving toward the yet to be known on the screen. Okay. Three sectors of clues. And then somewhere along the line comes the shift from at to from, from looking at the bike to riding it. Okay? And in that aha moment, there is contact with reality and possibilities. And I have to stop and tell you about this because this is actually what I wrote my dissertation on because this is the thing that excited me so much about what Michael Polanyi was saying. So this is the baby skeptic, and uh, I was reading Polanyi's work, and Polanyi just, every time he says the word real, <laughs> he adds this, this descriptor of it. And in particular, he's saying, you know you've made contact with reality when you have a sense, an unspecifiable sense, a hunch, a sense of the possibility of indeterminate future Manifestations. Okay, that's a lot of baggage. I, of course, abbreviated that to the IFM effect, effect, indeterminate future manifestations. That's what I wrote my dissertation on. But here's this scientist assuring this skeptic <laughs> that I can make contact with reality. And so what happens in the aha moment is it's almost like in that moment of encounter, I'm going to say, you are looking face to face down the barrel of reality and it's looking at you first, like that copperhead, <laughs> okay? And then what happens is in that encounter, the world opens up, a new world opens up and there's possibilities. So once you become a bike rider, the world comes to you in possible bike paths. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? So, and whatever your skill is, there was this moment where the world opened up and you say, oh, I'm a knitter, I can make things, right? So it changes who you are, it changes the world, and don't you see, it connects you with the real. So whatever was wrong with Descartes, you know, me in here, world out there, this dispels that anytime you have an aha and it connects you with the real. But there's been a recent historian who's argued 
So that's the moment of epiphany, back to Emmaus, all these great words and contact with reality, which I just love. Now, here's the possibilities. So if you're a surfer, right, what do you want? More waves. They sit out there on every beach you have, waiting for the next bigger wave. That's just what they do, right? And so there's vistas and possibilities. You go again and again, and each wave is a new possibility. Now, I love this phrase, communion with the real. I would like to suggest that that's what we're made for. We're made for communion with the real. And that's what the surfers are doing. They're communing with reality out there. And don't you see, it takes a lot of practice to get yourself to the place where you can commune with real on the real on a surfboard. Not something I've ever done, but I have done body surfing. And I love waves. All knowing in any field is subsidiary focal integration. And I hope that happily haunts you for the rest of your life so that you'll say, oh, I'm doing subsidiary focal integration, <laughs> which will make my point. Okay, that uh, uh, chemist at the, in the bottom left is John Polanyi who uh, did win a Nobel Prize. His father stepped away from science too quickly to get one, but multiple Nobel Prize winners came from uh, the father's lab, and including the son who continued his father's work. Uh, that's our former uh, football quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, who will be replaced this fall. Um, but um, I would say anytime you're watching a football game, and I mean my kind of football, on a Sunday afternoon, you are just watching subsidiary focal integration. And every play that gets made is a creative, artful, subsidiary indwelling of the playbook and the field and the defensive line and the offensive line to the goal of, you know, a touchdown. All knowing, to get back to Mel, is from to and beyond. One of the things I like about this picture is he's looking way down the road. He's not even seeing the poor ducklings. Uh, but in any case, uh, he's relying on embodying the, the uh, bicycle. His body is one with it, and he's looking beyond. And it's not that he's not feeling his body, it's that it's subsidiary, okay? And so this is actually going to lead me to start to talk about loving to know because all of that uh, aha moment opening into possibilities, uh, first of all, I'm going to say it's our loves that we, we move out of. There's something not yet known that we love, and then we go after it. And then when the aha moment comes, it's like you have met a personal reality that actually was waiting for you. And so it's a matter of encounter. So that's how I'm going to start to move toward the loving to know idea. Now, just before I have you break and talk this through, in light of what we've said about bike riding and subsidiary focal integration, what's actually going on with the defective knowledge as information mindset? Well, Pilani talked about destructive analysis which is a temporarily reverting to focus on what ought to be subsidiary. And what he said is the pattern disappears. <laughs> so if you're looking at or staring at rather than wearing, so what would happen if Mel looked down at his foot? What happens if you look at your foot while you're on a bike? It's not good. You end up in a ditch. If you do it in a car, there's, you know, it's just catastrophic. You know, it, where I am, uh, the state police who uh, test you for your driver's license, they test your peripheral vision. Well, the whole point of peripheral vision is you're not looking at it. So even the state police get it about subsidiary focal integration. 
So, okay, so when you look down at your foot on the pedal, the whole thing becomes opaque and the performance grinds to a halt. This is actually why it's so weird to go to the doctor. Because the, for you, for the doctor, your body's an object. Now, yes, thanks for holistic doctors who care about persons, but, but there is these weird moments where they're interested in your plumbing, especially as you get older, and uh, you know, just don't be embarrassed because it's not about you as a person. <laughs> okay, it's destructive analysis. All right, uh, if he, you know, you know have you, if you encounter gravel, on your bike, that's a problem. And it would destroy the pattern. And the same with the word balance, it becomes meaningless um, when we are like fixating on the word. So I would suggest that, the, that modernity's dominating knowledge as info mindset is destructive analysis, taking information and fixating on it. Fixating on the bits, okay? adding up the bits, going for comprehensive information, going for certainty or bust, as I say, and going for total control. And I would say that if you revert to fixate on what ought to be subsidiary, it blinds you to the real. It actually cuts you off from the real. And maybe you couldn't have seen that before, but I think you can feel it now. That's the problem. It's focusing on what ought to be subsidiary. I love about the subsidiary, it's not subjective, it's not subjective, it's not mystical, it's palpable. You can train your balance on the bike. You've got to have that bodily feel of balance on the bike in a creative way for you even to stay on the bike, right? It can be trained, it can be partly mistaken, it can be partly right, um, but it's really, it's, it's not private. It's not private, it's not subjective. In fact, if somebody's watching you like an authoritative guide, a coach watching you, keeping your balance on the bike to the end of training you, they can know more about what your body's doing than you are. That's why they're teachers. So the point, we need epistemological therapy. People in the modern West, inside and outside the church, need to be unleashed from a knowledge as info mindset to return to their original loving to know mindset. So does our Western perception of the gospel, and so does the church. Now, before you talk to each other, let's do a little science experiment. Everybody grab your pencil and a piece of paper, if you have it, and write a sentence, no more than five words. It can be any sentence, just write it. Now, <laughs> please. <laughs> If you're, if you're without paper and pencil, this isn't going to work for you, but you can imagine it. Got your sentence? Okay, here we go. Take your pencil, put it in the other hand, and write the same sentence. <laughs> and notice how much you're noticing what you're doing. how agonizing it is, how awkward it feels. This was where you were when you started out at school. Do you see how you're thinking about your body? <laughs> and it's not working out for you. Okay, so take your pencil when you're done that and put it back in the correct hand and write the sentence again and say, oh, praise God for subsidiary focal integration. <laughs> Look how cool you are that you can work with that writing implement on a piece of paper and it feels good. It feels good. So, you know, putting it in the opposite hand is destructive analysis, right? That makes the point. And and hopefully that underscores the great skill that your body has. I would like to suggest that reading is subsidiary focal integration. 
It just is. <laughs> um, you know, you have to learn to read. I taught m all three of my girls to read, and then at the moment when I thought I could, I'd give them this baby book where it was all, you know, phonetically appropriate words. I handed them the book, and I stood there with my camera and waited for the oh, I see it moment. And for each one, it came, and they went, <gasps> I'm reading, I'm reading. Well, words don't mean anything if you're just looking at the letters, right? Um, but if you're subsidiarily indwelling the book, world's open to you, and they're meaningful and rich. So, meaning. Okay, here's your chance to work it through. So with your threesome, see if you can with your particular example, and it could be that the three of you choose to talk about one of your examples, one of your skills. See if you can identify the features, what it was like before you learned, and where the OIC oh, at moment happened when it started to integrate, the integrative struggle, the clues in the world, your felt body and the authoritative guides, who was your authoritative guide, um, the transforming pattern and the indeterminate future manifestations. So uh, I'll give you eight minutes to have that conversation. We'll see if we can get back together in 10. What we to share is cool subsidiary focal integration testimonies. <laughs> so uh, somebody, something that somebody else in your group contributed about the skill that you're discussing to identify subsidiary focal integration. Could we start with a fantastic example Lorraine has shared? And I'm just going to ask her to share it with the rest of us because we thought it was fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> How hospitable that was, by the way. Just saying. Um, I looked at it from the negative in that what happens if you don't get to point B where all of that the clues, the body, the guide, the transformative pattern is not allowed to occur. And the example is I actually do shortened emergency foster care. Emergency foster care. And so you have a child who's taken from their home to a new environment, and I'll just read your, so your words are meaningless to the child, the situation is scary, heightened anxiety, their body is opaque. Um, the bike, you've had the bike's okay, but the, the home, the environment's okay. So they can't get to that stage. Then they're taken to another home, and they're all started again, and then another home. So they so never it's get, destructive analysis. So they don't ever get to the indeterminate future manifestation. Yeah. So their health, their hopeless, uh, their, the way in which they relate to people, they have domestic violence when they become adults, they become uh, homeless, they become dependent upon drugs, alcohol, their mental health declines. Yeah, wow, that was powerful, thank you. What so not to do and how to do it, my mother would have said. Other examples from your skill? Behind me. Behind me. We were thinking about the idea of um, sketching and drawing, um, so negative space. Sketching and negative yeah. space, okay. We've been learning that for the last few years, just trying out different things. Um, we wondered about the idea of a point B, because um, I can't remember what he started with, but he's, he's kind of explored different mediums um, as, he's, um, as he's developed. But there's no explicit end goal he's no. striving for. We just maybe we thought maybe expressing himself, um, maybe exploring techniques, but that idea of a point B could be. Yeah, that, so where is the point <laughs> B if you happen to be an artist? <laughs> um, at, there, one of the things that perhaps uh, can be said is, if you're talking about a performance, uh, there's multiple transformative moments along the way. So I remember as a driver of a car that when I started driving every day, I got better at it. So, and I, and I remember that as a certain moment, but, but you're carrying out the performance, and so you're draw, drawing, you are 
you know, an artist or are you, you are sketching. And then I would also argue that uh, uh, we also work toward a vision. So what it is that we're trying to express or what it is that we're trying to sketch would also count as at least that which is pulling us beyond. Yeah. Your example? Uh, uh, is a bus driver, which whenever I've been in a bus, I thought it used to be scary to drive one of these things. Yeah, in, in Sydney. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, uh, I'm a golfer, except you've just got to change because anyone who plays, it's not skill, it's de-skill if you're a golfer, because no one is skilled at golf. <laughs> but what struck us, what struck me, uh, uh, Xander was talking about how difficult it was to turn the bus at first on a rather tight corner because the wheels were a metre and a half from the front of the bus. So you've actually got to drive the front of the bus what looks like over the curb. <laughs> not actually, otherwise you won't get around it. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I did relate that to the golf swing where you're trying to push the ball out. You're trying to hit the ball that way, but if you're any good, you push it out that way. What it was the same in those is they're both scary because you're pretty sure it's going to go wrong <laughs> and so you don't do it. So it struck me there's something about that indeterminate future possibility that is scary. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's a trust of an authoritative guide. There was an authoritative guide that says, said you ought to. And, and, and if you're going to perform, you've got to trust. Even in golf, they often say, you know, even the top golfers, you know, uh, you know, the, the last words that, that I can remember VJ seeing after he won a tournament, he, he remembered the words of his son, Dad, trust your swing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So that's interesting. Trust is at the heart of rationality. Has anybody ever uttered that sentence no, before? It's very good. Uh, Goldberg uh, plays guitar. Um, and so he started with the, the, the observation. Say that it he, again. What was the example? He, he, he playing, he was learning to play a guitar. All right. Guitar yeah. play. Um, so the first thing is the, the observation within that constructive analysis of figuring out what do I do with my left hand and with my right hand, <laughs> and understanding that with the left hand I've got different skills, which is actually my non dominant hand, and my right hand has still got to dominantly have the rhythm going. So bringing those things together. Um, he, he was self taught, but he also worked with, with online. And for him, the, the most significant, the significant first aha moment was. I like this story and I'm now making this, I uh, like this song rather, and I'm now making this song. So you have this free look back to the I love the song, I can play the song. Yeah. Um, and then going further on, the, the possibilities that are being enjoyed by others was a positive reinforcement, but a big possibility was playing with others. Yeah. Which then reads on to the potential of a new song. Yeah. So Ensemble. I to him to be able to say, I can play with these people and I feel good about it. Yeah, oh yes, yes. Jazz ensemble, improvisational collaboration is subsidiary focal integration, which is another thing that's very cool about that. And, you know, the problem with that man up on the mountain over the mist is he's by himself. Now, according to Sarah, we're there with him, <laughs> right? I hadn't thought of that. But when you see ja jazz musicians, right? There is this communion that, that's going on. And so as a group, and actually we're doing this right now, is we're doing this big group subsidiary focal integration. So it's, especially you get the authoritative guide in there, you, there's just no way you're, you're solitary. Just to add, because we have the same guitar discussion, um, and where it all comes wrong, so when you, you got Mel riding his bike, if, if it's all done by memory and you're singing away and you're guitaring away and then suddenly you forget the chord yeah. and, and you look at your hand and you see your fingers but it's just it's doesn't work and, and the whole thing grinds to a halt. That's right. Uh, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> strings breaking do that to you too. Oh, well, no, you've got to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Paul. Can I ask a question just to try and work out the role of, did you call it destructive analysis? Yes. So. There's this house in Rome that was supposed to be, lots of historians think it's Augustus's house, but there's been a recent historian who's argued it's a completely different building, and it's not Augustus's house at all. 
So hasn't he used a form of destructive analysis to question the theory to become a new authoritative guide? So how do we get from one authoritative guide to another? How do we get yeah, great. from playing yeah. the guitar and we just are comfortable playing the guitar, how do we learn a new way of playing the guitar without destructive analysis? All right, so destructive analysis by definition for Polanyi is reverting to fixate on the clues. Um, but there's another way of feeling or sensing the subsidiaries. And I try to argue that if you're going to go to the bank on subsidiary focal integration, somehow you've got to attend to what you're attending from in a way that's not fixating on it. So, and so um, in Logging to Know, I talk about the Star Wars movie, the first Star Wars movie when Han Solo shows up and he says, I got a bad feeling about this. Well, that's a, you know, something's going wrong in his body and we all laugh because he should have had a bad feeling about it a whole lot sooner. But I think what's, what's going on there, you've got a sleuth who's sensing that things are not adding up. But then, yes, the sleuth is going to have to put forward an argument that actually paints a different picture so that there can be a switch. So Polanyi was all over, and look, it's legitimate scientists argue to persuade somebody of a different vision. So that's the kind of thing that's going on. We, I love the Hunt for Red October, that old film. We watched it on the plane on the way over. And um, there's this, this moment that I call the holy shit moment. I didn't say that. He really is the son of a bitch moment where he's in the briefing room, and it dawns on him that Captain Ramius is not <coughs> defecting, and, or he's not starting World War III, that he's defecting and trying to bring the Red October of this submarine with him. And well, that's what he says. He looks around the room into the silence and says, well, I think he's trying to defect. Well, everybody thinks he's crazy. The whole rest of the movie is his argument to show and then actually bring it about that Ramius is able to defect. Esther. So that sounds like that story. Esther. Yeah. Uh, j just to uh, uh, back up what Paul's saying, this is a bit of a zoom out, but it's worth what I'm saying. If you zoom right out, that knowledge becomes, how do I know God in the end? Um, my hero, Gregory of Nyssa, built an epistemology around what he called epectasis, which is infinite stretching out that will never stop. In so he didn't have the idea that when we get to heaven we know everything. Mm -hmm. We will continue to be re because he would say, Gregory would say that the uh, indeterminate future manifestation. manifestation is in fact God, and and God is literally infinite, so unknowable. Right. So how do I know the unknowable? And Gregory's picture was cycles of stretching, where I get somewhere and I know something, and then there's oh no, that actually didn't quite fit. But rather than that being pessimistic for him. Yeah. That's just a stepping stone to another iteration. Right. And in his mind, that will never stop. That's our That's destiny. That's right, me to too. So, you know, every aha moment is the doorway to another journey along your knowing adventure. And what happens is uh, encounter on encounter on encounter. And so reality just gets richer. And God is the richest of all. So yes, and I'm going to argue, unlike modernity, that that is highly personed. So if you know a person well, there are infinite, wondrous depths, right? Whereas in modernity, infinity is scary. It's alien. But it's not that way if it's a person. If it's a personal universe, this is just the beginning of communion with the real. And so what happens when you have an aha moment, let's say in gardening, is that's the beginning of this endless, beautiful relationship. Yeah, and, and just to back that up, Michael, can you put your hand up? Michael. Yes, hi, Michael. Hello. So you, Michael did a wonderful PhD in cell biology, didn't you? It's really fantastic to talk to him about it. But I can remember what you told me, which was when you began your PhD, the worldview of that 
class of body was where on the verge of understanding everything. By the time you got to the end yeah. of the PhD, right. we knew a lot more, but the horizon had stretched out and we knew we knew far less than we thought we knew. And, it, and that was lovely, right? That was lovely, yeah. The, the biologist I know best, his eyes just dance. They just dance with delight. All right, we're gonna move on because we want to go